Uh, please welcome to the screen Elaine Casket. Hi everybody. Um, I'm a little bit nervous because although I've done a lot of on-stage storytelling stuff, I haven't done very much online and man is it different. So, but those two performances were so amazing that I feel inspired to do my best. Um, I once had a job that was a thief. It robbed me of nearly everything, every waking moment, most of my sleeping ones, my health and my attention. And whenever this job broke into my mind, it's burglary tool of choice was my phone. Um, all my daughter's early drawings of me depict me with this glowing rectangle in my hand, kind of like a cyborg arm. And the stick person would always be smiling, but I knew, and she knew, that between those two dots for eyes, there was sort of nobody home. The stick figure was always somewhere else. She had a stick figure with a glowing arm for a mother. You know, I'm a psychologist and I know that to be grateful, to be really aware of all the lovely and amazing things in your life, you have to be present and you have to be aware of them. And I wasn't present. And for way too long, I wasn't aware. And it took a series of unfortunate events to wake me up. But eventually on this glorious day, I quit. I quit this job that was robbing me of all of my ability to be present and all of my gratitude and I started to write. And I was lucky and I got a contract and I was writing this book. And then for a while, while I was writing the book, it was absolute bliss. I had this flexibility, like all of this oxygen had been breathed into the room and into my family life. And sometimes my daughter and I even sat together and drew, which was unheard of. And we would put other colorful things on our hands to be holding other than iPhones, like flowers or uh, triple scoop ice cream cones. But then the minute that the book was published, this thief stole back into my brain. It wasn't just the job itself. It was something about achievement or accomplishment or recognition or something else. And it was back and I was back on my phone. And I was constantly monitoring how well things were going. So could I relax? You know, how many reviews, how many sales, and especially on Amazon, how many stars, how many stars in any given day, I could only feel like I could be truly happy or I could be truly grateful if my stars on Amazon were aligned. So at the end of this very stressful, watchful, preoccupied, phone dominated summer, my husband and my daughter and I went to a music festival. It was one we'd been there before and it was a place that we really loved. And in England, music festivals can be very damp and very muddy affairs, but this year in particular, Fortune was with us and it was warm and it was dry and we spent time with family and we spent time with friends who were there. Um, and I'd always in years past embraced this particular location's lack of 4G, but on this occasion, I was constantly trying to catch a signal. And if there wasn't a signal, I was touchy and I was anxious and I was not present. And if there was a signal, I was even more touchy and anxious and not present. And then something really dreadful happened. I lost it. I lost my phone. I was frantically patting down my pockets. I wasn't in the rucksack. I went to the lost and found place at the festival like one, two, three times. It wasn't in the tent and I was tetchy and I was snappy and I was disconsolate because what if I went for 24 hours without seeing what was happening on Amazon? What if somebody posted a bad review and I didn't have a chance to respond? And what if something happened on Twitter that really as an author I should respond to because I'm supposed to be building my brand. You're supposed to be building your brand, right? And what if I could build my brand until I was able to get back to London and get a replacement for my phone. And so then after all of this touchiness and my daughter's probably, she's nine, she's just sitting there thinking probably, oh my God, it's back and it's worse than ever. Here's, this is my mom. But then something magical happens. I don't know when it was exactly. It may have been half an hour or maybe an hour, but it occurred at the point that I accepted the fact that my phone was gone and there was no reason to keep on looking for it. 
And with surprising rapidity, my mind started clicking back into the present and night had fallen. My daughter historically stays out way too late at the very adult portion of music festivals. And she was ahead of me and she was navigating this tunnel in the forest of fairy lights around. And I could see her hair, which was a sort of like a blonde waterfalls rippling back in the back of her. She was dodging through all of these adults and the sort of the drinks in the dark. And up ahead of us in the forest, we saw a sort of Victorian shadow puppet theater that had been installed there for the amusement of those families that were there. And we could hear somebody, Jarvis Cocker, I think, sort of drifting through the, this, the, the, the trees from the main stage. I was thinking, oh, I'd really quite like to see that. And I feel a bit pulled and I feel a bit uncertain, but she's there and she goes behind the shadow puppet theater. And before long, this extinct creature, I think it was a dodo, emerges from stage left. And then suddenly there's another creature, I think it was a griffin sort of swooping in from stage right. And these sort of shadows meet each other. And it seems very still, even though this music is still drifting from the nearby stage. And I turn to the dad of the griffin who is standing nearby, and he asks me what I do. And I feel this stab of anxiety or self-consciousness again, but I do it. I say, I'm a writer. And I say, well, what do you do? He said, I'm a woodsman. And it turns out that woodsmen are not particularly talkative. And so we stood there in silence and in mute appreciation and watching the dodo and the griffin meet one another, not so much uh, a writer and a woodsman, but the father of the griffin and the mother of the dodo watching these two shadowy, fantastical creatures. And then it's God midnight when my daughter is still up and we go to a ramshackle structure back in the forest and it's a karaoke uh, event. And she goes and she stands and she goes and she signs herself up. And I don't even know what she signed herself up for. Uh, but then her name is called and she belts out this note perfect rendition of Gloria Gaynor's I Will Survive with as much determination and forcefulness as anybody who's ever been jilted and regained their strength. And there is this rapturous applause for this child and her eyes are lit up and she sits alongside me on a hay bale and she's able to join in the chorus what osmosis she's had. I don't know how she knows these things. It's hang the DJ, hang the DJ, hang the DJ and rocket man and you'll never live like common people and sweet Caroline. And then later still, and there are still bits of hay stuck to us from the karaoke venue. My daughter and I sit close to one another as our chair pauses at the very top of the oldest functioning Ferris wheel in Great Britain. It's a surviving hunk of Victoriana. And in the star-flecked inky black sky above us, there are bats wheeling and darting all around us. And it's chilly and it's one o'clock in the morning and she's wearing a knitted hat that looks like a chicken. And as the wheel starts to rotate in earnest because everybody has boarded, she insists that we both put our hands and our feet in the air and the smiling faces of the onlookers on the ground are blurry as we flash past. But my daughter's face as I look down at her is clear and her smile is wide and her joy is pure. And we squeal as we ascend and descend and we're rising into darkness and we're falling into light. And my happiness is so great that it seems to fill my body right up through my hands as they extend heavenwards. And I imagine our mutual gratitude illuminating our outstretched fingertips because we too are stars. Well done.